After the costly embarrassment of failing the notorious Elk test, does the new A-Class Mercedes-Benz finally go to the top of the class in terms of the more technical angles of engine design and safety? And in any case, what changes did they make to the original tipper truck version? Well, for a start, the whole car has been lowered slightly, 13 millimetres at the front and 10 millimetres at the back. It also has a wider rear track and greater understeer has been built in as well. The shock absorbers were changed and so too were the tyre specifications. But apart from those things, this is pretty much the original design. And let's not forget that where the A-Class is concerned, they pretty much started with a blank sheet of paper. And no doubt, after much scribbling and crossing out, the result has some incredibly ingenious design work incorporated. Let's go and have a look around. Cunningly, they've been able to make the interior space just four millimetres shorter than the C-Class version, from the back of the seats to the dashboard. But it's far more flexible. All these seats can be made to disappear. I'll come round and show you. Right, just three levers to play with here. Lever number one, back flips over. Lever number two, whole seat tilts up. Lever number three down here, and out comes the seat. Voila! Anyone for a minivan? The reason there is quite so much space is very clever, because down here, that's a false floor. Not the place to stash your family fortune though, because under there, you'll find most of the engine and transmission. And since that's below, it frees up the space in front for the passenger cabin. Because you're perched on top of what amounts to a sandwich of two floors, with the engine and gear train in the middle, the ride position is quite high, which gives better visibility all round. Side protection is also improved because the driver and passengers sit above the normal side impact accident zone. But the big safety advantage comes in the inconvenient event of a head-to-head -head smash. Front-on collisions account for almost two out of three accidents. Today, all cars have crumple zones designed into them to stop the engine penetrating into the passenger compartment. Nevertheless, a lot of injuries happen for precisely this reason. In the A-Class, not only is the engine and transmission housed partly in front and partly beneath the middle of the sandwich floor, they're also tilted at an angle, so that in the event of a crash, the whole lot slides downwards rather than straight back. The engines have also been specially designed for the A-Class and there are three versions. Two petrol, 1.4 litre and 1.6 which delivers 82 and 102 horsepower respectively. This is the 1.6 version and there's also a 90 horsepower turbo diesel which features something called direct injection common rail system. See what you think of this. Conventional high pressure injection systems have separate pipes feeding each cylinder. The Mercedes system uses a high-pressure pump that runs at a constant speed and supplies the fuel to the common rail pipe. This single pipe acts as a pressure accumulator and distributes the fuel to all the injectors while the electronic engine management controls the injection pressure depending on the engine speed and load. Oh, and whilst we're at it, there's also an optional electronically controlled five-speed automatic transmission, which happens to be the shortest and lightest of its kind anywhere in the world. So there. In fact, with the whole of the A-Class, Mercedes has pursued the concept of what they call intelligent lightweight design. It's based on the fact that a quarter of the weight of the car is made up of either aluminium, magnesium or plastic which is 30% lighter than conventional steel construction. They've also used a stronger type of steel than usual in the body panels, so that they could be thinner and lighter.
Now this is the 1.6 litre five speed manual with an added and rather surprising trick. You see, there's no clutch pedal. So when you want to change gear, you just lift your foot off the accelerator, the car senses that you want to change gear and an electric motor operates the clutch for you. So you then just move the gear shift as normal. It's very strange at first, takes a bit of getting used to, but certainly saves your left foot, particularly in city centres. The A-Class is certainly a car of many letters. After all, it comes bristling with ABS, BAS, ASR and ESP, and you almost have to be psychic to work out what they all mean. First of all, ABS, well that's simple enough, of course. It prevents the wheels from locking if you need to slam the brakes on in a hurry. BAS, brake assist system of course. If you make the brake pedal hit the metal in a hurry but not hard enough, the car does it for you. ASR, bit of a cheat this one, acceleration skid control. It prevents wheel spin during acceleration. All riders will be disappointed. And finally, ESP. No, not extrasensory perception, but electronic stability program, which incidentally was added to the car after things went topsy-turvy. Basically, what it does is to take all the fun out of going round corners too quickly, or swerving to avoid, say, well, an elk, by braking the car or slowing the engine down. And we find that it cuts in quite early, but it's very effective. All in all, this is a little technological tour de force. Mercedes-Benz have clearly turned somersaults to make sure that this is finally one of the safest cars on the road. Safe, that is, unless your chosen profession happens to be an A-class crash test dummy. How long do most car manufacturers keep a model in production? Well, if they're American or Japanese, between five and seven years. Obviously, some manufacturers keep things going longer. The Mini's been going 40 years and the Beetle 50 years. But how come the Maestro is still being built 20 years on? Well, the answer, believe it or not, lies in Bulgaria. It all started when the Bulgarian government decided they wanted a national car. The country had become independent. Rover found a factory, trained up staff, put in the tools and generally spent around £20 million on a plan to build the Maestro there from CKD, that's completely knocked down, kits. But at the 11th hour, things went wrong. The Bulgarians signed a deal with Skoda. There were dark stories of bribery and corruption, and Rover pulled out. And that left a large number of kits lying around, just waiting for someone to assemble. So, Ian, how come you're screwing Maestro kits together here in Ledbury? Well, we bought the kits from Rover in 1997, May 97, and uh, converted them from left-hand drive to right-hand drive. We've been selling them to the public ever since. And is it a difficult car to put together? We're very, very fortunate you couldn't wish to assemble a simpler car. It's quite straightforward. Uh, and they look slightly different to the Maestros I, re I remember. Why, why is that? Yeah, it was a Bulgarian market spec. It's a clubman, really, without a sunroof. Now, when you build the cars from the kits, you're converting them from left-hand drive to right-hand drive, but there's some interest in the left-hand drive models. Well, we've actually sold left hookers in the last few weeks for people to go into France and Spain because they're left-hand drive already. And you're doing the vans as well? Well, the vans are the 500, um, same again, 1.3, five-speed petrol, all in white. Now, I remember the Maestro launch in Spain. The top-of-the-range versions had a voice synthesizer that told you to put on your seatbelt and take off the handbrake. Now, we came down a mountain road, I hit a patch of oil, skidded into the side of the mountain, smashed the car very hard and turned it on its roof, and we skated down the road with cascading glass and shrieking metal. Came to rest, hanging in our seat belts, there was a little silence, and a voice said, low oil pressure. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't happen for the reunion of the Maestro. It's actually very useful to drive the Maestro because it uh, reminds you just how far car designers come 
the last 10 or 15 years. When the Maestro was launched, I thought it was very underrated. It got an image as uh, an old man's car. You used to see them smoking pipes with hats on in front of you at a stolid 45 miles an hour no faster. But in fact, there were some very quick Maestro variants. I remember the MG Maestro Turbo that was a real road burner, a lot quicker than a Golf GTI 16 valve, for instance, but somehow never quite had the same image. For 5,000 quid today, it's exceptional value for money. Five-speed gearbox, no power steering, but the steering isn't too bad. Very sparse and spartan plastic dash layout, but again, what do you want for the money? £5,000, of course, is not a lot for a brand new car. The only other new car on sale in the UK for a similar price is the Perdua Nippa, a Malaysian copy of an old Daihatsu and not frightfully desirable. So the Maestro makes quite a lot of sense compared to other new car prices. However, £5,000 will buy you quite a lot on the used car market. It would be silly to pretend that the Maestro is the same as a brand new current car. It is starting to show its age. And for £5,000, you could buy a pretty good second-hand car instead. Nevertheless, it is brand new. A lot of people in this country did buy Maestros first time round, and it could be coming up for retirement. You might think that a truly British car like this, and let's face it, there aren't many of them, would be the one to see you out. Somewhere in the beautiful Sussex countryside lies this house, which is home to an extraordinary collection of photographic glass plates, which chronicle the early days of motoring. It started by my grandfather in 1922, uh, working for what was then the Sunbeam Talbot Derrick Company as publicity photographer for them. He went on, um, even then they had to be autonomous and generate their own income in their, their departments as companies do now. Uh, so he was required to take in any other work he could get hold of, which uh, as he was doing automotive meant that he went in for Bentleys, Rolls-Royce, anyone else he could manage to grab. Robert today runs his family's photographic business, but has decided to transfer his incredible collection of automotive memorabilia onto CD-ROM. Old technology meets high technology. 12 by 10 plate cameras, um, not exactly very portable, <laughs> but they did. Um, you carried that around along with the slide case. Lighting was almost non-existent uh, other than flash powder, which was uh, fairly hazardous stuff to use. And uh, they made sure you made sure that every single plate counted because you had to carry all those with you. You could only carry around about a dozen, maybe maybe half a dozen extra slides. Um, not like 35 mil now. Of course, buying and owning a car was far different then. I mean, a, a Rolls-Royce, I can't remember the exact price of a, a Rolls-Royce chassis then, but um, it would have probably been something in the order of 900, 1,000 pounds, which was an awful lot of money. Um, you then, of course, took it or had it taken to the bodybuilders uh, where, and you selected what design of bodywork you preferred and uh, they then set about building a body for it. Nine months later you took delivery of your car <laughs> but it was of course your car and it was very much to your specification. But when did Robert realise that his photographic plates were so important? When we moved them last. <laughs> Six, six and a half tons plus of glass is, uh, is an awful lot of realisation. Um, being serious, we have known for quite a number of years that these were of great interest to uh, the automotive world. Um, we've had people asking to look at things for years. The big problem has been that the technology hasn't been available to, for us to make them easily accessible to people. So. What we've now been able to do with the advent of computers and CD-ROM and all the rest of it is to start scanning all the original plates 
put them onto put the images down onto CD-ROM, people can then look at them and they can then select whichever it is that interests them. We can then make the prints from the original negatives still. We have all the original negative uh, ledgers, um, which gives us, of course, the accurate date each photograph was taken. Uh, very often, other information, um, who the shot was done for, obviously. Um, quite often, body numbers, chassis numbers, all sorts of bits and pieces. And this is the first start of them. And they go on and on and on and on and on and on. And there are hordes and hordes of them. Um, we have boxfuls of them. If we can bring through into here. Let's move that out of the way. All on glass plate. There we go. EWP733. Well, I don't think that negative's been out of its bag in probably about uh, 30 or 40 years at least. Um, so we have some idea of what we're doing. Um, varying cars, one buses, or whatever the case may be. Um, and we're roughly putting on about a thousand images on one CD, uh, which takes some time to do. Um, we're very lucky in the respect that the quality of the original pictures are first class. So the scanning is made much easier for us. This one's actually been done now, so I can take it out like that. And you have to be fairly careful to pick it up like that. And then that goes straight back into its little pouch because we don't want to get it scratched. And that we do a thousand times for one CD, which takes an awful long time. The larger ones, we've got to uh, date back to motor shows. These are some of the ones shot on the 1210 camera, which uh, date back to motor shows a long time ago. Next CD is coming out. We're hoping to put Talbot, STD, uh, Lagonda, um, some motor shows out of the 1930s, uh, W.O. Bentley um, and Kevil Davis, and that should take us up to about a thousand images for the new one. My favourite uh, picture of the whole collection is, is a four and a half litre supercharged Bentley, um, head on, which I think sums it all up perfectly. It's, it's large, fast, heavy and horrible, <laughs> but a lovely car. <laughs>inside and it's absolutely typical Astra territory in here. It's pretty basic, pretty sparse. I'd love to say that it was a, a, an environmentally and ergonomically refined environment, kind of taut and with nothing extraneous, but it ain't. It's just basic in here. But once you've looked past that, notice that the materials used are pretty nice and the fit and finish is pretty good. And actually nestling away in this rather basic looking interior, there's a fair amount of kit. This is the SRI version. We've got air conditioning in here. We've got some 
rather tarty looking details like the white clocks and the little bits of chrome. These seats are sports seats, which is nice, but go beyond that and you have actually got to start to spend money on the bells and whistles to tart up your little teen idol. So it certainly isn't overly spent in here. Once underway, as with all sporty versions in previous incarnations of Astra, it is by no means the most refined of packages. It is two litre, it's 136 brake horsepower going through the front wheels, and those front wheels of course clad in pretty low profile chunky tyres. So there is plenty of grip, but there's also, as with all the previous SRI versions of Astra, plenty of torque steer as well if you do uh, apply the right boot a little too readily. And also around town where any smaller hatch is going to spend a lot of its time. It's a bit of a handful, mostly because there's a fair amount of movement on the take-up of the throttle delivery. In other words, you are left jerking backwards and forwards when you're driving around town, which makes it certainly not a car that's ever going to flatter you in the city and make you look or feel good as a driver. So where does this snappy young starlet fit into the 90s hit parade? Well, if the 70s were anything to go by, the late 90s are putting even more emphasis on the word radical. And if radical's the word, then the focus has to be the car. Sure, we've all seen and heard of Ford's new wildcard, and if initial reaction is anything to go by, then certainly Focus sings its song a lot louder than the Astra. Well, let's not forget that radical new ideas can take time to catch on. And in the meantime, don't be too surprised to see Vauxhall's Astra selling very well thank you against the opposition. And for my choice, well, Focus, Astra, radical new idea, Conservative play it safe. Well, why risk it? Actually, you know, we'll risk it. <laughs>